Father, we come to you because of the fact that by nature we are in rebellion against you. From the time we are born, our feet hit the ground running from you as fast as we can. We go astray from the womb speaking lies. Each of us turn into his own way. We're self-centered and selfish and grasping and greedy. We want to live for ourselves, and we only have our own plans and goals in mind. And it offends us when we hear the rude doctrine that God has his plans, that God has decreed and ordained whatsoever comes to pass, and that we are part of the fabric of the divine plan of history, that history is his story. And history is moving along a predetermined track, and each station it comes to has been predetermined. In the fullness of time, you sent your son. And he got off on time. And when they came to murder him, he said, it is not my time, and they couldn't do it. And then he said to Pilate and to Herod, now it is time that I should be delivered over and be crucified. Father, we thank you for the fact that we can understand we all have a destiny. We have a purpose in life. We're not the product of an accident. We're not simply junk. We're not something kicked up by contingency and lady luck. But you've created us with purpose that we should glorify you and enjoy you forever. And Father, as we turn to the Scriptures, we ask that you would curb our rebellious nature. Oh, we understand what the psalmist said. When the heathen raged, we will not have this man to rule over us. We will cast his bands asunder. We will snap his shackles. But you, O Lord, who sits enthroned in the heavens, laughs. You mock at the stupidity of finite creatures challenging the Almighty. Father, help us to take security in the fact that you are at the helm of the universe, that we are not hurtling into a void, but we're running along a predetermined path in which to everything there is a meaning and a reason. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you take your notes in our discussion of biblical anthropology, we have already established the principle that since the very essence of the definition of man is given in Scripture is that man was created in the image of God, you first have to define God before you can run off and define man. You have to look at the reality from which the image is cast. You got to look at the real thing before you look at the shadow. And thus, we have been looking at the fact that God is not to be compared to electricity. He is not the force, or it is not the force of Star Wars fame. God is not simply an it. He's not cosmic energy or mind. God cannot be reduced to an idol as Krishna, Vishnu, Brahman, or to the elephant gods, or to Zeus or Thor. Instead, the Bible declares that God who exists is infinite and personal at the same time. He existed from all eternity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He created the universe out of nothing. So you're not God and I'm not God. He's God and we're never going to be God. We have to know our place in the pecking order of the universe. Now, we already saw last week that the Scripture is filled with verses that attest to the fact that God does not do things nilly-willy. At the spur of the moment in panic, sort of a, oops, what do we do now? Instead, the Bible tells us God has an eternal plan 
Now, some one person got mad with me a couple of weeks ago when I said, we worship a Jewish God. Then they thought about it. Well, think for a moment. Is it the Muslim God? No. Is it the Hindu deities? No. Is it the God of Ibrahim, Isaac, Yaqub? Yes. Is it a Jewish Messiah? Yes. Jewish prophets? Yes. Hebrew Jewish language? Yes. Bagels, gefilte fish? Yes. Of course, it's the God of the Hebrews, the God worshipped by Abraham, Isaac, and da uh, Jacob, by David, by Moshe, by Moses, by Yeshua, Baruch Hashem, HaMashiach. You see, God has a plan. And every Jewish person will tell you, plan your work, and then what? Work your plan. If you fail to plan, guess what? You plan to fail. Now, if that is known by humans, do you think the Almighty created the universe without a plan? He just sort of woke up one morning and there was an egg called the universe. And there it was. God was taken by surprise. People get these foolish ideas of God fumbling in the universe and not knowing what to do because the universe is going in directions that he didn't plan on or he doesn't have a plan. Well, we've already established by so many verses that God has a plan. Just a word to our visitors. Um, I get irritated, particularly here in Southern California. Number one, the average Christian no longer brings a Bible to church. Well, why should they? Most sermons, they don't need it. Nobody's looking anything up anyway, so why just take that pound Bible and leave it next with the coffee cup on top of it? Well, they also figure, well, there's a Bible in the pew. Yeah, that's where the heathen <laughs> who come to church don't own a Bible, never saw one, and they have one in the pew. They can, But, of course, generally they never take it out because they don't need it either because they'll type it out and throw it on a screen and no one looks up a passage. In result, the average Christian doesn't know the order of the books of the Bible. If you tell them, turn to the prophecy of Hezekiah, turn to Hezekiah 5.12, they will be looking for weeks for Hezekiah, not knowing there is no such book as Hezekiah. If you ask them to go to the minor prophets, the epistles, they fumble because they're not trained to open a Bible. The end result, God's people don't read the Bible. They don't know how to study the Bible. They can't follow along in the Bible. They're not checking the context, and the end result, Arminianism, Socinianism, Almoraldianism, and all other isms, flourish in Southern California because nobody knows the Bible. You see, you can take the Bible out of context anytime you want and get a pretext. I can quote half a verse just as any cultist could. Make it quick. But if you bring your Bible, you actually turn to the passage, you look at the context, and I try hard not to just give you the one verse but I look at the verses before, the verses after. I give you the context. Why? I'm trying to teach you how to study the Bible. So it defeats the purpose if you don't bring a Bible. Another reason, I could have put all the verses down. I actually first did that. Then I said, no, I'm going to make them write down these references. Why? God's people are lazy people. They're lazy. They're used to everything being done for them. Let me tell you, God's work will not be done by laziness. You need to bring your Bible. You need to open it up, find the passage we're going to look at. You need to follow along, look at the text, underline the words, and try to understand what you're reading. 
Christianity is not so much felt as tout. It is taught as well as caught. It's not feel, but think. That's why the Apostle Paul said, by the renewing of your mind. Notice he did not say refurbishing of your emotions. So you shout hallelujah. No, the purpose is education. One of the members said, I know what you're doing. You are actually taking us to seminary. These are graduate level courses. I said, yeah, these are the same material that I would teach at Westminster Seminary. I'm teaching here Thursday night. What I expect of those students, I want to expect of you. But I didn't go, so it's time you go. How many of you know that the Bible says that all Christians are ministers of the gospel? Please raise your hand. If you're a Christian, you're a minister of the gospel. So when do you get to go to seminary? When's your education? Are you going to be an ignorant minister or one who understands and studies the Word. Um, I know many of you, I'm sort of catching you off guard on this. You'll bring your Bible next week, but go ahead and look in the pews and find something and try to follow along. Look in the table of contents, fumble around, you'll find it little by little. We're now dealing with C, the counsel of the Lord. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is the difference between counsel, C-I-L, and counsel, S-E-L. Now, you see, because the words are pronounced virtually the same by many people, they don't have a clue what the difference is. Now, the counsel, C-I-A-C-O-U-N-C-I-L, refers to the group. In this case, it's the Holy Trinity the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who existed from all eternity and were perfectly happy without you or me bugging them. They were not lonely. They did not have to create man. They were perfectly capable, as Jesus said in John 17, the glory that I had with you before the universe was created. So the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one being three persons, is the eternal council, C-I-L, the Trinitarian council. Now, council, S-E-L, refers to the rulings, verdicts, decrees, and decisions made by the council. See, a council, C-I-L, makes Counsel. My son went all the way to be an Eagle Scout, and uh, we had to join the Boy Scout Council. Council. Now, the Boy Scout Council would then give its counsel concerning trips and things of that nature. In other words, the council would make decisions. It was empowered to do that. Well, in the same way, for example, we read in Genesis 1, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as the council said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. See, so, so the council of the Trinity made the council of the creation of man. Is everybody with me? reason I'm doing that, I bugged a few people. Do you know the difference between the council and the council? And it ended up, duh. Wherever there's a council, there was a council. The group that makes these verdicts and judgments and decrees and decisions, you see, refers to the Holy Trinity as illustrated there in Genesis 1. Would you first turn to Psalm 33? We need to first establish the fact that when God does something, he does it because of a decision that has already been made. And these verdicts, rulings, decrees, decisions, which are called the counsel of the Lord, 
are spoken of with the attributes of God himself. For the context, verse 6, By the word of Yahweh the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth all their host. Verse 9, For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord nullifies the counsel, notice it's not S-I-L, but S-E-L, of the nations. He said, now the nations. Actually, in the Hebrew, it's the goyim, the Gentiles, the heathen. Do nations make decisions, verdicts, rulings, decrees? Yeah. The Lord nullifies them. So the Third Reich under Adolf Hitler had some decisions. Who nullified his aspirations to control the entire world? The Lord nullifies them, brings them to nothing. That's for openers. Not only does he nullify the counsel of the nations, he frustrates the plans of the peoples. Sure, we all make plans. How many people in Southern California hope to be a millionaire by the age of 30? I meet these entrepreneurs all the time. And all of them have champagne wishes and beer pocketbooks. And they say, Dr. Bob, we love you and your ministry. When I make my first million, Dr. Bob, I'm going to bless your ministry. Of course, I never see a dime of them now. It's always, I'll get in a million next week. Then it'll be high time. We have a lot of entrepreneurs. God bless them. We got any here? May you be a millionaire. And remember old Dr. Bob. <laughs> but you know, the Lord frustrates the plans. We make plans. You, you probably made a plan to marry somebody other than what you ended up with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Some of us plan on a career and you don't end up there. Who frustrates your plans? God. Well, who does he think he is? Yes, he is God. Now look in, look in contrast. The counsel, not the group, but the decisions, the verdicts, the rulings of the Lord, what? They stand firm for two weeks. <laughs> they are solid for a year. What does it say? Forever. Look at the contrast. Look at the contrast. Got to get into the mood here. The plans of his heart. Now, and it's called ellipsis in grammatica. The plans of his heart stand firm for one generation. No. From generation to generation to generation to generation. His counsel, his decisions, his verdicts, his rulings stand firm, solid as a rock. And all the generations of time, merely as waves crashing on a granite boulder, make no difference to the Almighty. Turn over to Proverbs 19 and verse 20. Now we're going to learn that the counsel of the Lord is immutable, unchangeable, unalterable. You say, well, why is that important? Because you've got all these people running around today. Oh, I don't believe in the immutability of God, says Gregory Boyd. God changes his mind and his plans all the time, says middle knowledge. God is caught by surprise, his pants down, caught in the toilet. Oh, look what happened while I was busy. You've got to change his plans. But when you look at what the Scripture says, Proverbs 19, remember who wrote this? Melechem Shlomo wrote this. See, we mispronounce it. We say Solomon. No, it's Shlomo. Say Shlomo. Shlomo. See, the, the, the Brits, they came in and they mispronounced all the Hebrew. It's, it's Melechem King 
Shlomo. Here's what Shlomo said. Many are the plans in a man's heart. How many say amen to that fact? We have a lot of plans going on. Verse 21, Proverbs 19, 20. But the counsel of the Lord, it will stand. Unalterable, immutable. Now I had a ways, one of these wise acres. He wasn't content with that. Well, it doesn't say immutable. It doesn't say unchangeable. You see, Maury, you're just going into philosophy and reading that in there. I let him wax eloquently. See, you let the heathen do that because you're giving them a shovel and they're digging their own what? Grapes. I always figured, why should I dig their grave for them? I said, here's the shovel, honey. You dig your own grave because then you're going to go in it. Turn to Hebrews 6. Hebrew 6. In the context, proving the superiority of the new covenant. Verse 16, for men swear by someone who's greater than themselves. And with them an oath given as a confirmation is the end of every argument. In other words, look, if you say, look, as God is my witness. This is the best car. It only has 20,000 miles on the odometer. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16. People will swear to verify the truth of something by appealing to someone greater than themselves. And that's why people said, as God is my witness. Or when they get in the trial, they put their hand on the Bible I swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me my mother-in-law. <laughs> no. So help me Bill Clinton. No. Bush. No. So help me whom? God. You end an argument by doing an oath in which you appeal to someone who's greater than you. In the same way, verse 17, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise. We can't do that right now, but you ought to do a study of the heirs. It begins in chapter 2 at the end, where the angels come to minister to the heirs of salvation. It's a euphemism for the elect, the chosen elect. The heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his counsel. Is that what it says? Some translations, the immutability of his purpose. The Greek word is counsel. His decisions, his verdicts, his rulings, which the Trinitarian counsel in eternity made, those counsels made by the counsel are immutable. Now, the Greek word is very clear. Unchanging, unchangeable. Unchangeableness meaning incapable of change. Then, of course, they immediately excuse themselves and say, can we move on? I said, yeah, we'll move on now to Ephesians 1. We've already seen God has councils that stand forever from generation to generation. Number two, they are immutable. Number three, they are universal in scope. The book of Ephesians. Ever notice how these Arminians love the word all? As soon as they get that word all, they just, oh, this is my word. Like they see the word world and say, this is mine. I said, no, it ain't yours. Matter of fact, you really don't want that word all. <laughs> you don't believe a whit of it. What do you mean? Look in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 11, also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined, predestined according to his purpose 
Notice it doesn't say our purpose, your purpose or my purpose. We are predestinated according to whose purpose? His. Who is right now, ergo, I'll give you the Greek, orchestrating. Isn't that beautiful how the Apostle Paul would, would take these terms? Christmas time, we were in New York City at the Metropolitan Opera. And we see the conductor. And he is orchestrating, bringing the elbows up, the French horns, the violins. There goes the drums. And it's, he's orchestrating and making music. And here the Apostle Paul takes that language. Do you know that God predestinated us according to his purpose? And he is the one who is right now orchestrating how many things? What does it say? What does it say? All things. And the army said, well, not everything. We have our free will. And, we, and I said, wait a second, I thought you loved that word all. Now all of a sudden you're saying all don't mean all? Well, yes, you, it, it doesn't mean that, that he's orchestrating the decisions of man. In other words, all doesn't mean all? Then they say, well, no, all doesn't mean all. I said, then what were you yelling about over in 1 Timothy 2 that all meant all? You admit all don't mean all here. By the way, you're wrong. This is where it does mean all. <laughs> Who is orchestrating all things after, there's our word, what? The counsel, the verdicts, the decisions, the decrees, the judgments made by the divine trinity from all eternity. God is orchestrating. Think of the, the Lord standing before the whole universe. Galaxies spinning, comets flying, solar flares leaping, and he's there. The music of the universe. He is the conductor, and he's orchestrating the entire universe according to his decisions and verdicts and rules. And you and I weren't around. It's not our counsel. It's his. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his what? Counselor. The answer is nobody. So don't think you're a backseat driver when God's driving the universe. Turn left! And he turns right. Slow down, and he speeds up. Lord, let me take over, and I'll drive the... How many of you have ever heard, maybe you yourself said, if I were God. Did any of you... Can I ask that? Did any of you ever think, well, if I were God, I wouldn't look Grammy die. If I were God, I'd make me a millionaire. If I were God... How many of you ever think if you were God? Come on. Let's get some Godhood people here. Well, thank God you never made it. Because there are times I said, I wish I were God, and that guy would be a grease stain. Bang! He'd be just a flash of fire, and he'd be gone. It's universal. You see, the context determines how much all means all. Here, the context is all-encompassing of the entire universe. Number four, the counsels of the Lord also cover the acts and even the sins of men. Turn over to Acts chapter 4 and verse 28. Now, as I said last week, someone gets concerned about Adam biting the apple. <laughs> Well, let me tell you, that small peanuts compared to the murder of Jesus Christ. Let's go for the whole inch a lot. Let's take the big sin. The grandest evil that was ever done is deicide. When the creatures got together and murdered the Creator. I think that's more significant than taking a chunk out of an apple or a persimmon. Some people claim it was a persimmon. 
you look in Acts chapter 4, after Pentecost, the disciples filled with the Holy Spirit went preaching the word. Some of them got caught, had to pay a price. Peter and John were beaten up, thrown into jail. They got released, verse 23. They went back and reported how that they were threatened and beaten. They were told they can't preach anymore. And the people of God were led in prayer by one of the saints. And this saint quoted from the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. You see that in verse 24, and verse 25, and verse 26. Remember this. He didn't quote tradition. He didn't quote some human counsel. Roman Catholics are dead here because this is when, you, when the going gets tough, the tough go to Scripture. For truly, verse 27, in this child they were gathered together against thy holy servant Yeshua, whom you did anoint. Now we have the roll call of the ones guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Get on these talk shows. You hear them? Well, some people say the Jews killed Jesus. If you believe that, you call too because you are full of hate speech, are you? <laughs> say, wait a second, friend. I think you need to hear this verse. You want to hear the roll call of those who are guilty for crucifying Jesus Christ? Herod, even his wife, warned him. Pontius Pilate, that Gentiles, that takes in all of you. And the peoples of Israel. Now, is there anyone left? <laughs> that's every, that's the roll call. The Bible does not say, kill the Jews, kill the, no, no, no. We all nailed the Son of God. Now listen carefully, verse 28. To do whatever thy hand and thy counsel predestined to occur. You said, no, wait a second. You mean what Herod did, what Pilate did, what those Gentiles did, what those Jews did. You mean somehow or the other they did it, but at the same time it was according to the counsel, the, the decisions and decrees of God. Yes. You say, well, how can that be? Well, you've got to think Bibline. You see, the revealed will of God is found in Scripture. The sin is the transgression of the law. Either you're failing to live up to it, so you miss the mark, or you transgress it. Sin is defined as a transgression of the law. And that's what it is. Sin is the violation of or lack of conformity to the revealed will of God. Thus, in Acts chapter 2, Peter said, You with wicked hands crucified the Lord of glory. Were they in sin for crucifying Jesus? Yes. Did they lie? Yeah, there were false witnesses. Did they hire a mob? Yes. Were there people who were in it for the money? Yes. A lot of wickedness, jealous. The gospel writer said the reason the Pharisees did this, they were jealous how the people loved Jesus. They couldn't take the competition. But at the same time, they're telling us that these violations, you see with that curvy line, the violations of the revealed will were within the confines of the secret eternal will of God. Deuteronomy 29, 29. That which is revealed belongs to you and to your children. That which has not been revealed is none of your business. Maury translation. <laughs> Are the secret things which belong to the Lord. So he said there is the revealed will of God and there's the secret will of God. The revealed will is what we ought to do. Husbands, you ought to love your wife, even as Christ loved the... You know, 
Women, those who are married, you ought to submit to your husband. Ought to you? But this, the re secret will of God is what is in fact going to happen. And what happens, the men don't sacrifice, the women don't submit. And they get fighting about who's going to wear the pants in the family. But see, in Scripture, does it matter if it's the death of Christ? It doesn't matter if it's the sin of Adam. It doesn't matter if it's beating up poor Joe, throwing him in a pit, selling him into slavery. Joe looks back and said, all of these evil things you did. And he says, brothers, you did these evil things. But then he says, all of the evil things you did were part of God's eternal counsel. You say, well, you have to choose. No, I don't have to choose between two. They're both true. You are responsible for what you do. But at the same time, what you do is part of a bigger plan than you. So we all think we're the center of the universe. All of life, including God, is rotating around us. I want to be happy. What about my needs? My needs. God doesn't care about your needs as your needs. It's where your needs fit into his needs to glorify God. Turn over to Isaiah 28 and verse 29. Are you learning how to study the Bible? Yes. This is what I want you to do, learn how. The big question we had tonight was, where do we go after we finish biblical anthropology? Uh, pray for us as we're meditating on that. Maybe we ought to do a book study and just go through a, a small book in the Bible and show you how to do it. I don't know. You got some idea? You pray about it and come on up and let us know. Isaiah 28 and verse 29. I love Isaiah. He was always into trouble. <laughs> they sawed him in half, and I've seen that saw many a time gleaming out in the, in the bushes waiting for me. <laughs> Look what it goes now. See here. Isaiah 28. Verse 28. Grain for bread is crushed. Indeed, he does not continue to thresh it forever. Duh. Because the wheel of his cart and his horses eventually damage it. He does not thresh it longer. This also comes from Yahweh of armies, the Lord of hosts, who has made his counsel. What? One. God's eternal counsel, which came from the eternal counsel, sill, is wonderful. So don't you dare say that God's counsel is mean, sad. Well, isn't that sad? No, it's wonderful. See, I don't mind telling somebody God has a wonderful plan for your life may be wonderful for him and not for you, but it's still wonderful. <laughs> his counsel is wonderful. And his wisdom is what? Great. That's why in Jeremiah 32 and verse 19, we read in terms of the context again, verse 17, Ah, oh, Lord God, Jeremiah 32, verse 16, After I had been given the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, then I prayed to Yahweh. Ah, Yahweh Elohim, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy, thy great power and by thine outstretched arm. You ever wonder where that song came from? Nothing, nothing, nothing is too difficult for thee. And have you ever sung this? Nothing, nothing. This is where it comes from. 
here in the midst of his prayer, nothing is too difficult for thee. Who showest loving kindness to thousands, but repayest the iniquity of fathers unto the bosom of their children after them. O oh, great and mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Great in what? Counsel. And mighty indeed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, giving to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. That's even quoted in the New Testament and applied to Jesus as one of the proofs of his deity. Lastly, turn to Psalm 73. We began in the prayer book of the saints, and now we're going to end in the prayer book of the saints. Psalm 73. This is a psalm to read, by the way, when you get jealous of the wicked who seem to have it so good. See these drug dealers and pimps driving by? They look like they're living mighty high, you see. Verse 21, when my heart was embittered, and I was pierced within. Then I was senseless and ignorant, and I was like a beast before thee. This is why I love the Psalms. This is part of Christian experience. You ever felt this way? Absolutely. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast taken hold of my right hand, with thy counsel, thou wilt guide me and afterward receive me into glory. The word receive is actually the Hebrew word for translate used of Enoch and Elijah who would translate it. It's one of the few passages in the Old Testament that looks beyond Sheol in which the author here actually assumes that at death he will go into heaven where the, the glory, the Shekinah glory of God is resident. But here he says, the counsel of the Lord will guide me. Well, what in the world is he talking about? Well, Scripture contains some of these eternal decisions, verdicts, and rulings, and therefore we are to seek guidance from the counsel of the Lord that has been revealed. So we trust in the Lord with all our hearts. and We don't lean to our own understanding. In all our ways, we acknowledge him by listening to the counsel of the Lord. When it says, don't date unbelievers, guess what it means? Don't date unbelievers. When it says, don't get drunk, don't get drunk. That's the counsel of the Lord. You say, what does this have to do with anthropology? Well, in closing, each week we see the same thing. If the God in whose image we are created comes to decisions and makes verdicts and rulings, that are wise, that are great, that are wonderful, that plan everything out, then what should be your responsibility as the image bearer? It means you should not live a shiftless life. Oh, you meet these Christians. They float from job to job to job. What are you doing? Well, I'm working at Ralph's this week. Boy, you're getting to be 45 years old. Well, I haven't found my career yet. <laughs> they float. Where are you living this week? Oh, I'm down at Huntington Beach. Well, I thought you were up at Seal Beach. Yeah, they threw me out. They evicted me. If you want to reflect the image of your creator, you better be making plans, making decisions, verdicts, rulings. 
wise decisions, planning, executing the plan, not living life on the spur of the moment decisions, not happy-go-lucky, irresponsible people. We've got a generation of them here. You see him traipsing in front of Judge Judy and all the rest, making babies. Remember, said, oh, this is the guy you made the baby with? Yes. Are you married to him? No. Are you living with him? Yeah, again. And I have another baby, but, and you're not married? What do you do, sir? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> what, you're 55? I don't know. People are completely adrift because they don't listen to the counsel of the Lord. They're not making de wise decisions. They're not even looking at life in terms of having to make decisions and verdicts and ruling. They're purposeless. They're meaningless. This is why you've got to preach to them good old Calvinism. God created you with a purpose. You have a destiny. Go fulfill it! remember one time preaching a message and it made everyone make a poster. My goal in life is to find, follow, and finish God's will for my life. There's the three F's. Find, follow, finish. That is your responsibility. And I said, you give your kids... Their duty in life is to find, follow, and finish God's will for their life. Don't you dare say to your kids, well, what would you like to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to be an astronaut. I, I want to be this and I want to be that. No, that's how the heathen talk. You have it when someone comes to your kids. Now, Tommy, what would you like to be when you grow up? Whatever God calls me to be. Well, uh, Tommy, but what do you want? I want what God wants. Oh, Dr. Mori, your son is ill. <laughs> I mean, this is not normal. We have infinite possibilities. No, you don't. The only thing that means anything in life is finding, following, and finishing God's will for your life. Forget about your will, your plans. They don't work anyway. Remember what Paul said, if we shall see, that's coming up next week, the will of God. You know, there's a lot of verses. I'll just give you one peekaboo. <laughs> brother James, the half-brother of Jesus, natural son of Joseph and Mary, wrote the book of James. He said, get with the program, brethren. Don't merely announce we're going to go to a town and set up a delicatessen and sell pastrami and bagels. And Don't just say that. Say, if it is the will of God, then we'll go and we'll make some money. Because you don't know what tomorrow might bring. There may not be a city there the next day. You don't know whether you'll stump your toe and die of gangrene. What is your life? It is as fragile as a puff of smoke. <sighs> you better start saying, if God wills, I'll get married. If God wills, we'll have a child. If God wills. But you notice James is talking to people who were moving according to a plan and making plans to set up a business, make some money. He wasn't talking to people who were sitting on their behinds. Lord, provide according to our needs. Well, are you working? Lord, provide. I said, are you out there searching? Provide. You can tell sometimes I was a mean pastor. Some people thought I was mean. I wasn't mean. I just said, he that will not work. What? So, so this woman comes, I need money. I said, fine, uh, the, the church can help you out, but we'll give you some duties to do. What? I said, can you mop? Can you sweep? Can you help? I would never do that. I just want the money. I said, no. Mm -mm. 
Matter of fact, I remember this couple came. We got him set up with the job, never showed up. He just wanted a hand out. He said, we don't give handouts, we give hand up. You got to be about finding God's will for your life. And I don't care if you're 40 years old and you still don't know what role you play in this world. Any Jewish boy by the age of 12 was about the bar mitzvah. He was supposed to be married by 18. His career. Apprenticeship until 30. 30 to 50, he's the master of his craft. 50 on, he's the wise sage giving advice. We've lost it all. We've become so Gentile. Everybody wants to run around. Nobody wants to get busy. What is your purpose in life? If you cannot tell me, you can't tell God either. What about your counsel? You have any? That's the challenge. The God in whose image we were created was not a hapless drifter. He was not a hitchhiker in the universe. He made his plans and then he worked his plans. And that's what you must do to be in the image of God.